So as you are starting to edit your images, one of the things that some of you have already started to notice is that some of the images are a little dark or some of them might be a little orange or some of them might be a little blue or, you know, there's adjustments that you kind of need to start making. One of the reasons why I want you to go through the editing process first before you start adjusting your images is because I think that you should focus your attention on those top few images that are just the best, okay? You could spend hours and hours and hours going through and adjusting images that are not even close to your best. If you get the project done and everything's all set and you want to spend some time editing some of the images that didn't make the cut, fine. But for now, you should probably just be worried about how do I edit images that are my top ones? So you make those selections and then you go into editing. I do the same thing when I shoot a wedding. <clears throat> you know, if I shoot a wedding, I'll shoot 15, 16, 1800 photographs sometimes. Depends on how long the wedding is. But I don't want to sit there. For, I mean, that would take days to edit all those to perfection. The truth of the matter is that the reason why I shoot 1800 photographs and only give my clients two to 300 tops is because they're not all going to be at perfection anyway, right? Okay, I'm only human. Um, so I try and narrow them down first before I start getting into the process of by, you know, where I start editing. So now, uh, once you start rating and stuff like that, you're going to notice something's going to, um, if, if you're paying attention to your, um, uh, to your images, you'll notice something's happening in the folder. So I'm going to right click here and I'm going to say reveal and finder. I just want to open up this folder here. And um, what I want you to see is we've got these CR2s here. That stands for camera raw. And uh, oh, this is a good one. I just did 9485. Let me just see if I can find that one. Uh, sort by file name. 9485. Okay, I want you to see something here because I'm pretty sure. Wait, I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? Oh, I didn't. Okay, well, anyway. Well, let me just. Um, can I rotate this just to. Oh, there we go. Counterclockwise. Okay, so I'm going to rotate this image. So, you can see I've given this a rating, I like, the, I like the image, so on and so forth. Take a look at the preview though, if I click on the CR2, notice that it's still vertical. You see that? It's still vertical. And what you might see is a file right underneath it here, which has the exact same name, but has .xmp, and if I click on it, there's no image file there. Okay? So there's the image file, and this is the xmp file. Here's what's really cool about Camera Raw files. You can edit them without actually changing the original picture. This is actually very advantageous because all changes that you make to the image are actually saved in this XMP file. So when I just rotated that in the bridge, notice my original image not rotated. That ro rotation command that I gave the computer is saved here in this XMP file. This is really cool, very handy, because it allows me to continue making adjustments to my image without actually changing it. Now, the adjustments that I can make in the bridge are pretty basic. I can rotate them and so on and so forth. But I might want to make some changes that are a little bit more dramatic. And the way you do that is by opening your images in Camera Raw, which is actually a program, it's a plugin in Photoshop. All I have to do is just double click, because it should be the default, or you can right click and say Open in Camera Raw. And what's going to happen is nothing. Oh, see, it opens up Camera Raw right here. This is cool because you don't even have to open up the plugin. Uh, or Photoshop, I mean. This plugin exists in a bridge too. If, however, let's just show you what normally happens, you double click it, what it's actually going to do is it's going to open up Photoshop. 
But what's neat is it just opens up the Camera Raw plugin in Photoshop, so it's basically the same thing. The only difference is, is now you have Photoshop open as well as the bridge, which on a slower computer could be a big deal because Photoshop takes up a lot of memory, uh, but, and so does bridge, but on these machines it's not that big of a deal. But it's kind of neat, you can open it in this Camera Raw plugin without having to open up Photoshop just by right clicking on it. So now, there's a couple of things that I want to show you here in this interface, first things first. Um, the first thing is you can rotate them here. So you've got this, this line of tools here, okay? And, and uh, they all do some real basic things. So like the hand tool. If I zoom in down here, or click in here and zoom in, and then I want to move to a different part of the image, I can hold the space bar down and get my hand tool or I can just click on the hand tool and move it around and I can inspect certain specific portions of the image. Um, what's it giving me here? What's that warning? Oh, well, I guess it wasn't much. I was expecting to tell me something. Then I can zoom in and out there. <clears throat> the crop tool, I'm, not, I'm gonna, not gonna go through all these right now. The crop tool actually allows me to make my image, like to zoom in on a certain specific part. And once I do that and hit return, it actually crops in. Now what's really neat is all that extra stuff that I just deleted, it's not gone. It's still in the image. Now if I were to crop this in Photoshop itself and then save it, I'd actually lose the information. You would lose those sides. You'd never be able to get them back. So it's really nice to be able to do stuff like this in Camera Raw in a way that doesn't damage the original image. Your original image stays intact and you can always go back to the original. So let's make a series of changes. I'm going to undo that crop. We're going to make a series of changes and I'm going to show you how easy it is just to go back to the original. So, you know, you've got a couple things over there. Rotate, crops, pout, all you have to really worry about. I'm not going to worry about the rest. You can explore them later. What I find is really important is this thing right over here. This is what we call a histogram. And this is a graph of all the colors and pixels, well, the pixels and what color they are in the image. And if you can see uh, an image, especially that has uh, a great shift in one or the other. So I'll take a look at this and you can see how the red is way forward over here. Now that might be normal. Maybe I photographed a, a, a photograph of somebody with bright red clothing on. Then I would expect this. But when I look at this, this is wood. Now it's warmer wood. I wanted it to have a warmer color, so maybe it should have a little bit of red, but it's really red. So what I can do is go down here to what we call our color temperature. And what this deals with, and we're going to do a whole lesson on color temperature later on, this deals with the color of the lighting that was on my object. And I can adjust for that. So if I push it to the right, you can see how things get more red and more yellowish. But if I go the other direction, watch the histogram start to change here, and watch the colors become more neutral in, our, uh, in that piece of wood that I was photographing there. Now my eye can try and go to perfectly neutral, but then it starts to look really cold. Wood is not bluish, it's not perfectly grayish, unless it's been burned and it's like charcoal-y. It has a warmth to it, so that was too far. So I can slide back and forth until I see right about here, this looks pretty good. And I can also adjust my tint. I can add or subtract a little, I can add a little magenta, or subtract the magenta and add some green to kind of neutral it out, make it more neutral. But you know what? I always do that after I adjust the color balance a little bit. First, because I find that I don't need the tint as much as I need the color balance, the temperature change. Below that, we see a couple of other adjustments. The first is exposure. If I judge this accurately, yeah, it's a little dark. It's a little dark, and I had brighter ones, but let's just say this was the only one that I had. I can grab the exposure, and I can start to lift it up. Now, notice what's happening not only to my image, 
but also my histogram up here. You can see how the majority of my tones, my pixels here in the middle, are now moving up. This is good. If you have a really well-balanced image that has a lot of middle tones, this should actually kind of look like a bell curve. For those of you who've taken statistics or physics or something like that, theoretically, if you've got an image that has a lot of middle tones, which is you know, like an average image, you won't have a huge spike here at the highlights, and it will go higher in the middle and then back down to my shadows. But what you can see here is I've got a huge spike in the blacks. And what that is is this area here and then these deep areas here. So I've got a lot of black in here, but then I don't have a ton of highlight. I've got a lot of my middle tones. So looking at that, kind of understanding that, allows me to kind of judge the histogram as well as judging the image visually when I start to make it a little brighter. What I don't want to do is I don't want to go so far that look what happens to my highlights. Not only, you might say, well, they're too bright, but really what I'm looking at here is I've lost detail. If I zoom in on them, okay, I've lost detail that I could see before, and I don't want to do that. And you can see that in the histogram here because you've got this massive spike here on the highlight. That's an indicator that you've started to lose details. So if I bring this back here and go somewhere in the middle, now you can see a lot of those details pop back in. Right below this slider is another slider called the recovery. And the recovery actually helps you get your highlights back if you go a little too far too. So I might feel that I need to go up really high for my midtones to get them to look nice. Whoops, sorry, wrong button. Oh, ah. Sorry, I went to Photoshop. Um, but then I can hit my recovery and slide that and see if I can get some of my highlights back. The problem with that is a lot of times your highlights will start to go kind of grayish if you go too far with the recovery. So I'm going to slide the recovery here, kind of bring that back down. That's starting to look pretty darn good. I've made a really big improvement actually over the original image. If you remember the original image, I've made a huge improvement. Actually, we can look at the original image. I can just switch back to the bridge. There's my original image. You see how dark it is? It's kind of gloomy. It doesn't really show us a lot of texture. Our highlights are basically brown. They're not, they don't, we don't have a real nice, bright, white highlight. And so now by changing that here in Camera Raw, look at the major difference I've made in the image. It's pretty dramatic. And I've only done two, three things. Color temperature, exposure, and a little bit of recovery. You can also play with the fill light, which lightens your midtones a little bit. See, look at that. Really brightens the midtones only. That's a really powerful tool, but be careful. It can go really bad really fast. I can just adjust my brightness overall. The bad news about that is it usually changes your darks as well. Stop. Um, so if I start to adjust my brightness, you'll see that the black areas that are in my background will start to go gray. You don't want that. Um, I can also increase my contrast. And what that does is it takes everything that's kind of over here in the mid highs and it pushes it to the right so they become high highlights. Takes everything in the mid lows and pushes it towards the left so that anything that's in the, that is in the lows will start to become pure black. I don't like working with the contrast slider. You lose detail. Let me say that again. Just using brightness and contrast, I try never to touch those if I can help it. Because with both, both of them, but especially with the contrast slider, technically speaking, whether you can see it or not, you are losing detail with the contrast slider. You may be losing detail with the exposure slider, and the recovery slider as well, but it's less noticeable and less dramatic than when you do the contrast slider. So I try and work my way down. If I can get the image looking really good with these top series of sliders and never touch this stuff down here, then I'm happy. I'm not happy and I know it's a bad image when I really have to get down here and start playing with the contrast a lot or the brightness a lot. You know, that, that to me means that the image was poorly photographed. 
I underexposed or overexposed a ton, and now I'm trying to fight the mistake that I made when I was using the camera. And let me just say this, the easiest thing in the world for you is to pay attention and make a good photograph in the beginning. Take your time. So it takes you an extra minute or two to shoot a good photograph because you have to make some corrections. That takes a lot less time and a lot less effort than what I'm doing right now to try and fix what was an underexposed image. Does that make sense? So if you can make good photographs in the camera and not worry about all the exchanges here in Camera Raw, you are far, far better off. You'll spend a lot less time on the computer and more time shooting, which is nice. Now, there are also, just to show you, but we're not going to go in depth here with these, a bunch of other tabs here that you can play with to help your image. So here's like, um, this first one's a tonal curve. I love the curves, especially in Photoshop, but again, you can start to lose quality pretty dramatically if you use it, so I try not to use it. But you'll notice I can go in here and I can adjust my highlights. Look at how it's changing the curve there and pushing my highlights up. I can adjust my lights, which is kind of in the middle there. I can adjust my darks, see? And then I can adjust my shadows and my really black areas for a little bit more drama. You can see how the curve changes here. This is a histogram, just like what we see above, except it's a little more condensed. And it doesn't show you the different colors. Um, <clears throat> sharpening. If the image is a little soft, you might be able to add sharpening. But be careful. It does not fix an out-of-focus photograph. There's no magic here. If it's slightly soft, it will help a little bit. If it's out of focus, blurry, motion blur, nothing is going to fix that image. It's destroyed. It's damaged from the very beginning. Don't bother trying. Um, and you can just play with those sliders. We have convert to grayscale, which is kind of fun. You check that, and you can adjust what colors are lighter or darker. So I can say all my reds need to be really bright, but all my blues will stay really dark. It's kind of fun. In split toning, which is like giving it a color cast, I, I don't find, yeah, that's usually a thing. Lens, we're not gonna worry about lens profile corrections, um, but that's some pretty cool stuff you can do in there. You can add grain if you wanted to. Uh, kind of see, let's see if I zoom in here. Can you see how it's starting to look really grainy? Come on. So that's the original image. As I add grain, it can get really grainy. Why would you want to do that? Well, I don't know. I can think of a couple options, one of which you've got two photographs, one is grainy and the other one is not, and you're trying to match them so they look similar. You can't get rid of grain, but you can add it. So you add it to the one that doesn't have grain so that they look more like each other. That's about the only reason why I could really think about it. Or just artistic, you want it to be, you want to be artsy. Camera calibration, I'm not going to worry about that. Um, presets, well, I'm not going to worry about that. So, you know, effects, that's about it post-crop vignetting. So a vignette adds like blurriness around the edges. Well, not blurriness, but like color. In this case, it's like white and gray. Kind of like old school photographs that had that. Um, I never use that at all. I think it most of the time is really cheesy. So I can go dark, you know, whatever, but we don't want that. Okay, so now, last, last quick thing about this. So once you're all done your image, notice that down here, the buttons say open image, cancel, or done. If you click the open image button, it's going to take this, and it's gonna, this image is going to open it in Photoshop for further editing. Anything you do in Photoshop itself, is what we call destructive editing. In other words, when you save, you'll be saving over top of the original. 
Now the good news is it can't save camera raw files, so you're going to have to save a second file that's a Photoshop file. So your camera raw file will still be uh, fine. However, we're not going to get into Photoshop at all for this first assignment, so don't bother. All you need to do is click the Done button. So let's just do that and watch what happens in the bridge. In a second, now it updates to my new image. Okay. Now, let's say I'm not happy with the changes I made, or I come back tomorrow, I don't like them, I want to change them, fine. Right click, reveal in Finder. Here's my image. All my changes are saved in this XMP file. So all I have to do is trash that file, or even just move it out of the folder, and it returns to normal, back to my original. Pretty cool, huh? This way, as long as you're working within the Camera Raw plugin, you can experiment and try things to your heart's content and just go crazy on it. You will never damage the original image. The worst thing that can happen is when you go and do what I just did and delete the XMP file, my fear is that you accidentally delete your image. So be very careful that you don't delete the CR2 file by accident. You have to make sure you only delete the XMP file, which is why I think it's a good idea to move it out of the folder first, check it in Bridge, see if it changes, and then when it does change, okay, great, then delete the XMP file, which is now in a different folder. Does this make sense? Hopefully this is a help to make your photographs look a little better. Uh, and uh, especially some of the ones that are a little underexposed or something that will make them look a lot better. Okie dokie. All right.